The 2003 theatrical release Agent Cody Banks is a PG-rated spy adventure starring Frankie Muniz as the titular teenage secret agent who is recruited by the CIA into an undercover program meant to train young operatives, which is actually a genius idea. I mean, think about it. In order to find a missing scientist who is being forced to create weapons of mass destruction, there's no better way than to hire a 15-year-old to become the boyfriend of that missing scientist's teenage daughter. And after that, we'll just see what happens. I agree, that plan sounds like it kind of needs a whole second paragraph that didn't get printed, but whatever, Uncle Sam is not stressing out over a teenager's life being at risk. He's saving his concern for the more valuable, tax-paying human lives, if you know what I mean. So go Cody, good luck getting blown up in a helicopter or whatever. But in reality, this whole movie is getting blasted today. When I break down all of the mysteries, gadgets, and womanizing of the 007 movies from which most of this was inspired, except, maybe even more uncomfortable due to extremely inappropriate age differences, romantically precocious teenage boys surrounding you in a locker room, plus a troubling level of racisms and shocking perspectives that you didn't notice as a child. Like when you visit a grandparent in the hospital and they start describing members of the hospital staff that they don't trust. So grab your coolest gadgets and start apologizing for grandma in this weirdly specific type of movie that comes out when neither Disney nor Nickelodeon are involved. For a super secret spy a binocular installment of Clip Breakdown Live. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown Diet Coke. This is the playlist where, oh gosh, we splattered all over. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content found on the web, and we crack into it like a can of Coke, and look at each individual section, clip, and a minuscule bite to break it down and say, that's been contaminated with bad info, or that's an undercover good guy. I'm not Cody Banks in the CIA. I cannot just hum up with terms that sound on theme all the time. Unless it's a movie about like, mm, cute boys and makeup, then we can talk, but for real, I did not know what to make of this movie. It came out when I was 12. I know I was 14, I guess. Yeah. So I wasn't watching it. I don't know. Seems like it's more meant for 12 to 13 year olds. There's a big difference. So watching it now as an adult, I was like, okay, this is one of those things that just doesn't age well. Kind of like New York Minute with uh, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, where you're like, it's such a blatant racism <laughs> that it's like, these are textbook examples of the microaggressions that get forced into our brains as children. Also encourages kids who are non-white to feel different different in this society, which is just, we're trying to undo it, we're trying. But before we do get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up, that way you never miss new videos from me. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, or if you've been watching and you just like, mm, whatever, it shows up in my recommended and I don't care, maybe you click the subscribe button and we make this YouTube official. I would love that for us and our relationship. And for every single person who clicks subscribe on this video, I will be happy. <laughs> You thought it was a giveaway. No, 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 it isn't. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon. Check it out if you want to. But what I want to right now is dive in to this thrilling spy adventure from MGM. It begins as most teen movies did at the time with a kid waking up in his messy room and going downstairs to a shit house of a family. <laughs> Cody's almost 16 and never had twice as many dates as him. Sitting in a treehouse isn't exactly a date. It is when you're playing doctor. Well, you know what they say, boys will be boys. And in this movies, boys be sexually competitive by the age of 12. And they already objectify women and think that's what romance is. This joke is gonna fly over the heads of most kids under the age of 18. So at least it's mostly legal adults who get to feel super unwell about a 12 year old talking about playing doctor. Just to give you the Wikipedia definition, playing doctor is quote, a phrase used colloquially in the Western world to refer to children examining each other's genitals. So great job admitting that in front of your whole family and all of your breakfast foods, kiddo. Eating your conspicuously empty box of Cap'n Crunch, I don't trust you. I feel like this little brother is bringing a really bad energy into the breakfast scene, but it's hidden underneath layers and layers of busy family eating breakfast before school cliches that we've seen in every movie. One person, usually the dad, randomly eating cooked food, eggs and bacon, a dog being fed under the table or taking food off of the table, and of course, the main character who survives off of one sip of juice and one bite of bread. Off he goes. The little brother Alex is obviously old enough at 12 to know that playing doctor refers to bodily exploration since he basically says that's how he gets more action than 
than Cody. What I want to know is whether he explains the meaning of that phrase to his date before taking them up to the treehouse. Or is he being intentionally deceptive to gain access to the bodies of his innocent and naive schoolmates? Well, I'm not a child psychologist, but I'm just gonna say this kid gives off that long-haired childhood sociopath vibe that you get from like every season of Law & Order SVU. So I think whatever he's describing falls under the umbrella of quote, child on child sexual abuse. Oh God, why did I have to say that? An overt and deliberate action directed at sexual stimulation as compared to anatomical curiosity. I know that kid is an actor, but it's the adults who wrote the script who concern me. As an adult myself, I frequently find myself in unlicensed medical examinations that take place in a treehouse. And nine times out of 10, it turns out I was just following along with the sketchy suggestions of a 40 something pervert in Hollywood. And guess who had the privilege of producing most of the movies in 2003. A 40-something pervert in Hollywood. That's right. That's probably the reason all prepubescent 12-year-old dialogue sounds like it's from the sex crime manifesto of a 40-something pervert in Hollywood. We connect the dots here. The parents of Cody Banks are in this movie, but very perimeterally. I cannot remember who this mother played a mother in. She was a mother in everything. Cody Banks, who's your mom? Cynthia Stevenson. Oh, I think she was the mom in um Dead Like Me. Am I not right? Dead like me, dead like me, dead like me. Dead like me, yep. She's a mom and dead like me. Oh, I'm sweating already. She's sweating. That was bugging me all day not knowing who that was. So I'm glad to get the relief here with you in front of my face, my sweaty face. Okay, so Cody is like any other typical nerd that everyone hates at school. He's conventionally attractive, has cool clothes, and rides a skateboard. I'm already buying it. But we do find out pretty soon that he's not just your average underdog. He's also got some pretty special secret skills. There's like a baby who's irresponsibly left in a parked car and then that car starts rolling down a hill and we get a no joke five minute scene of a stunt guy and an empty car driving around with all these like set pieces getting crashed into and Cody Banks is like riding his motor board skates to save the baby and he does jump on the car and save the baby like just in time. But then like a true hero, he saunters off to school before anyone can give him the accolades he deserves. So clearly something is not all normal in Cody Banks' world. I I do, however, hate that we just wasted the first five minutes of this movie on an action sequence that did not factor into the main plot of the movie. I would have loved if like one of these bad guys were about to meet or their henchmen had like witnessed Cody doing all this crazy stuff. And that's what tipped them off that the CIA might be using sleeper agents who are 12 to 15 to like thwart their plan, which we're about to discover back at the lab in the middle of nowhere. The main action takes place in Seattle, but this was all shot in Vancouver. Vancouver, Canada. We meet this wacky science, you can tell because his hair is all this way, some dad from the Disney Channel, and he's working on his little tiny robot invention. An oil spill, one of the most serious threats to nature. You wait, the nanobots. Lovely. Baby seals everywhere will praise your name, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, such a good response. It made total sense to me. Except how are the seals even going to learn the doctor's name? They're just babies. It takes a few years before they can even learn to pretend to read a newspaper in front of audiences at SeaWorld. Brinkman here, great villain name by the way, Brinkman, is the leader of a evil agency called Eris, which consists of extreme political radicalists who are as intimidating as they are mysterious. I'm talking no clear motives, no moral compass, and no country of origin. Just foreign and vaguely Middle Eastern like a pita sandwich. I swear, nothing embodies the early Islamophobia of a post 9-11 America quite like a kids movie where you'll have an antagonist whose name is like Osama McDonald's being played by a white British actor in brown face paint. And then he'll say things like, Assalamu alaikum indubitably. At this rate, I'll have dismantled every old Navy store in North America just in time to celebrate Christmas with me mum. Like, okay, that's definitely not gonna be great for a good portion of the US population, but at least Hollywood seemed to be aiming for accurate representation when it came to hair and makeup. Check out that artificial looking hair color. And that stark one dimensional coating of bronzer lets us know that at least one person in the makeup trailer had been doing their research on the animated character Aladdin. They had legendary actor Ian McShane stepping onto that set being like, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's brown face. We basically learn in this scene that the nanobots, which our scientist, mad scientist guy has been hired to make to clean up oil spills, something we all want and love, was actually being designed by 
by this guy to basically be a weapon. The stupid dad scientist is like, oh yeah, but you could reprogram it to one, the nanobots want to eat any carbon-based thing or silicone-based thing. And they're like, oh, carbon and silicone sounds like my hair, skin, and nails, so they apprehend the dad who is then like forced to reprogram these bots to want to eat human bodies, basically. All carbon-based life forms, which to me, I'm like, that's a scary plan. They're gonna like unleash nanobots onto the world to cause mass death. We love to see it. I wish if this were like an R-rated movie, you'd get a couple scenes of major cities being just decimated by those little bots. But we can't yet because we have to get a little bit of exposition. Let's head on over to the CIA of the USA where the leader of it all is is telling us how we have the duty to like take down this scientist who has been working accidentally to create this powerful thing. We have double agents on that foreign in laboratory and they keep getting captured, but we've learned that they have this American scientist hostage and our only chance to get to him is through his daughter, Natalie, played by Hilary Duff. And the way they're gonna do it is by enlisting one of their young youth CIA agents. This is where the movie starts moving way too fast for my brain. It's like they start recruiting smart kids from comic book stores and they go to what looks like a camp for regular kids, but actually they're secretly getting trained for the CIA. So all across the country, they have these kids. You see these pictures that are like, some some of them are like from 1930. That's truly the costume designer's school picture. They're like, let's use it as an Easter egg. Anyway, they land on Cody Banks with his adorable headshot, actor's headshot, and they're like, he's the best womanizer in school and he's gonna be the perfect person for this job. And then we cut over to Cody in school and we realize that might not be true. He might not be so, so fluid with his language when he's talking to the young ladies. Hey, Cody. <laughs> Are you in special ed? First of all, Natalie, I was only hesitating until I could think of a nicer way to tell you that your hair looks dry. When I first saw you, I thought someone was sitting here disassembling a scarecrow. As for the special ed comment, <laughs> I happen to think that all education is special because it's a privilege to learn. But let's unpack your question a little bit further. We're both sitting here in the same classroom, learning the same material off the same worksheets. So if I were in special ed, not that it matters, you would be too. And even then, I basically carried you through our group project on Night by Ellie Weissel because you didn't finish your PowerPoint slides on the overarching themes of father and son. Come on, Natalie, you walked all the way from Oz to the Emerald City to get that brain of yours. Put it to good use at school, huh? Let's apply it. Along with maybe a leave-in conditioner after every wash, right, Crispy Teigen? Sound good? Because of this embarrassing interaction, bully at school, who, don't worry, we'll never see again except for one scene that I barely watched, he's given him the ribbing in um, locker room town. That's how they say it. I literally skipped gym freshman year. And then the rest of my high school career, I think I just gayed my way out of it. I was like, I can't. And I would do it again, fuckers. Anyway, as Cody's getting made fun of, in walks a bombshell of a suited up woman. <laughs> the trailer had this shot of her cleavage. This is Angie Harmon, by the way, playing a handler for the CIA who enlists Cody's help. If this woman in dark sunglasses came up to me, Cody, I was so confused. I didn't know if that like video we saw of Cody at summer camp was from like this previous summer or like just like a weird time jump thing. Cause Cody's acting like he's never been to a secret agent camp when she comes up and yeah, she gets the business from some of the boys, but she tosses it right back in a way that I feel like she should maybe have not have or maybe could have had this conversation once Cody left the room where the little boys are changing. I'm just old fashioned and new fashion. Always fashionable to not be near those naked boys. Hey, I want to be in trouble. <laughs> Since you're on the business of taking towels, take mine too. Oh yeah, sexually harass that adult lady, bro. She looks just like our moms. Show her your dick, show her your dick. I hope they have pizza sticks at lunch today. High school is the f***ing worst. Anyway, this mysterious woman, or Cody's new handler, is named Ronica. Not Veronica, just Ronica, because the Veronica would sound too normal for a movie. And there's nothing normal about Ronica, okay? For example, she has a thing for walking into the boys' locker room, snatching away their towels, and exposing their flesh-colored underwear that we're not supposed to see, and then using that towel to smash them in the genitals one by one until every boy in ninth grade is infertile. And that's what makes this movie just like James Bond, because then we hear an original song by Adele where she goes, teenage impotence. 
and you get that like shutter effect of the thing closing. That's Cody Banks, impotent. Anyway, it's time for Cody to get rescued from his doldrum life as a real student and become a fictional student who also has a job that's more important. They put him on a helicopter. He's flying through clearly Vancouver places. Veronica makes it clear. She's like, I'm not your partner, I'm your handler. And then when Cody shows up to the CIA, he's immediately detained by a well-meaning but not so up on the deets CIA security officer. I would think that as a security officer, you would be intimately aware of who expected at the building, but whatever. The real head of the CIA comes in and sets him straight. You've just apprehended the most important kid in America. Mr. Banks, this way, this way. Welcome to the CIA. Which, by the way, stands for Continuous Interior Ambling, referring to how our entire headquarters is just one multi-purpose event space in which no one is allowed to sit down, not even in the bathroom. Just a bunch of extras walking with purpose. Next, we'll be wading through our special toilet hallway. Rubber boots recommended. I think that someone from HR needs to speak with that security guard because it's not workplace safe to make jokes about taking one's life. So we need someone to confirm that he isn't joking. Also make sure he got someone else to cover his shift for the rest of the week. I don't know if you noticed, this has been the third clip in a row with some kind of problematic humor that would not fly today. No wonder so many of us millennials are still working to unlearn our subconscious prejudices and resolve our mental illnesses. This movie is basically solidifying for kids that it's normal to do blackface and it's funny to call people the R word. I get it if you feel nostalgic watching kids movies from the early 2000s, but I also wouldn't be surprised if movies like Agent Cody Banks also encouraged kids to lean into racism, ableism, and wanting to shoot themselves. In fact, I think those were the most popular televised categories at the Kids' Choice Awards that year. At the CIA brief meeting or whatever, Cody lets it shine how much of a genius he is. He's like, I know what nanobots are. They're small robots that do small things. And they're like, oh my God, it's Jason Bourne. Cody starts to panic a little bit when he realizes his mission is basically to get Natalie to like him so that he can get closer to her and learn what her dad is up to. He's like, but I can't even talk to girls. The CIA guy's like, at camp you said you had the best time with girls. You were so good with them. And he was like, that was camp talk. I was lying. Which like, well, weren't there girls at that camp and we could all see how much you suck at talking to them? How come you were so good at learning about nanobots and riding skateboards through an obstacle course, but you couldn't gain the confidence to talk to a girl who sucks? That's what I want to know. We go over to, what's the guy? The guy who played George Bush all the time on SNL. He's like the Q. He gives them all of these fun gadgets, like a hologram watch, a a skateboard that does surprise things that we don't know about yet. He gets a few other things. None of these tools really come into the plot. There's no big singular mission that he really uses any of these inventions on. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like this movie is so disconnected. The other being like, we gloss over his whole recruitment and training process. You need to show him getting recruited and then what that camp is like, even that if that's just the first act, it could have replaced all of this, basically. Anyway, the CIA lets Cody tell this story that he's been given a full scholarship for being an excellent student to this preparatory school where Natalie attends and they send Veronica Veronica in as a school administrator to convince them that this is all legit. Cody, among other gadgets, gets $9,000 in cash. The brother almost catches him and is clearly suspicious and nosy about all of this, but Cody is, fends him off for now. By the way, I want to give a quick PSA that, um, hot girl summer is here. Actually, no, I'm calling this cook for thyself summer. It's a summer where we cook for thyself and we speak in old English apparently, whatever you want to call it, I am doing it thanks to the help from today's sponsor, Every Plate. If you're looking to eat well and budget your food expenses this summer, which I want to do because I want more money for experience sauce, Every Plate is America's best value meal kit. I've been trying to put people onto this service for the last 7,000 years, it feels like, because I'm obsessed. Every Plate is 25% cheaper than grocery shopping with no hidden fees, so I'm getting a great value, and they're innovating constantly. I am staying cool this summer thanks to their oven free meals. Dinner recipes such as linguine with burst tomato and kale. You can set up a cantina style shrimp taco bar or beef banh mi so it's like you're eating out and you still don't have to heat up the oven on those long hot summer days. You'll also be doing a big favor to the environment. Every plate is, unlike other options, a sustainable choice. Every plate offsets 100% of their carbon emissions when shipping their products conveniently to your door and also you'll have a 
31% lower carbon footprint when cooking a meal from every plate on average compared to supermarket meals of the same portion size. And I even find that I'm able to finally unwind during the cooking process rather than get stressed about all the measuring and ingredients and shopping. And I can just enjoy some time when me and my dog are cooking a meal that she begs me to feed her, but I cannot because of the cheese. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code 49NICDERAMIO. For those who are in summer mode, that is $1.49 per meal when you go to everyplate.com and enter code 49NICDERAMIO. Now, once your bodies are nourished, let's get back to the issue at hand. On the first day of school, he doesn't go alone. He's going with a van of surveillance people. They're listening to him all day, basically. When he expresses disappointment that he has to actually attend school and by all intents and purposes, be a great student at this school, Veronica lets it be known that she doesn't love this assignment much either. This isn't exactly what I had in mind when I signed on to the CIA. Yeah, join the club. I didn't think I'd be shepherding teenagers. You know, maybe you should try decaf. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that joke really tickled agents Gooner and Bader in the back of the van over there, didn't it? Nothing angers me like when a movie tries to sell an unfunny joke as funny by having other characters in the scene crack up at it. That just draws more attention to the unfunny joke. You two in the van, tell me why that's funny, you forced laugh f***ers. I love calling people f***ers tonight. That's like my new catchphrase. Cody Banks, f also, Ronica was basically muttering that line. It's the first time we see her break out of that tiresome secret service stoicism that her character otherwise has, but it's hardly like she seems over-caffeinated. Basically, Cody, the decaf joke doesn't work here. You should have asked her if she's on her period. That one always gets them. Ronica is a little like inconsistent to me. She's like mad about this assignment and then Cody is like showing his invulnerability as a child, basically being like, what if they don't like me? And she's like, what's not to like? And it's like, I don't know. It's time to go to his first class. Turns out this school has bullies too, and they all hate Frankie. However, when he spots Natalie, he has a good chance, you would think, at impressing her because he's studied all about her. Favorite jewelry is turquoise. Favorite author, T.S. Eliot. Favorite brand of pads, Kotex. Let's dig in and meet our Hilary Duff, who I love, in her first theatrical film role. Uh, I especially love T.S. Eliot, the way she captures the female perspective. T.S. Eliot is a man. Well, if you want to get all technical, of course, but you know, you never know these days. Ooh, Cody was talking about transgenderism before conservatives started telling us it was something we just suddenly made up to be cool. Like, no, mama, there have always been transgender people. They were just not acknowledged by the puritanical Westerner that just inbred their way down the family tree until you were born. That's what happened. But I am a little confused. Did this child genius in the CIA think that the name T.S. Eliot was short for transsexual Eliot? Creative, at least. Not right. How long has it been since we had a problematic joke. Doesn't matter. Let's get another one in quick. Do you by any chance happen to be in special ed? Ew, why was that the same cringy joke but with more words added in? She said, do you by any chance happen to be actually, factually, fee fi fo fana, no captually, be dip da dip da dip do opta do be do developmentally delayed? Like, oh my god. This stupid joke and presumably the one that it's calling back to from the other school sparked outrage among audiences, understandably, to the point where MGM had to include an insert with the DVDs sold, trying to address it. The note said, and I quote, regarding the references to special ed in the movie, we in no way meant to be insensitive to kids with special educational needs. Rather, it was meant to show how cruel kids can be to one another. As you have seen, Cody overcomes his own speech problems and saves the day. Thank you to those who brought this to our attention. We will be mindful of it in the sequel. In the sequel, couldn't you have just cut it out of this movie? Seems like it would be a lot easier. Although I guess in the age of DVDs, they might have already had those produced and couldn't edit the movie. They're like, we're trying to show how cruel kids can be by being equally as cruel to them on a bigger screen with celebrities. Also, I thought Cody just stumbled over his words when talking to girls because he was nervous. They made it sound like this was the king's speech and he had to overcome a speech impediment to succeed in all of his skateboard rescues. But whatever, PR team, they're on it. Wrote us a paragraph. So at first it seems like, oh man, Frankie, Cody, he said you were so hot with the ladies. But thankfully the CIA has made sure that he is in all of her classes. And he asked, he's like, I'm in all of her classes. Isn't that gonna be a little creepy? It 
it's like, I um, mean, no, it's just statistically gonna happen. I don't like my makeup much today. I feel like I have little beady eyes and I shaved, so I have zero face on the bottom. Whatever, you get what you get. The next scene, Cody and Melissa, Natalie, have driver's ed, and they both really wanna get their licenses, but ugh, this teacher, who is a caricature of an Asian American man, is really tough. Driving is a privilege, not a right. No, 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 no. Get out of the driver's seat. We'd like to have a word with you about Mr. Banks' driver's license. Immigration paper, okay. This country has clung so hard to its racist portrayal of Asian people in the media, you would think it's a form of fossil fuel. This actor, Chen Chang, was fluent in five languages. So I'm pretty sure this inscrutable accent when speaking English is played up for laugh. Something I would imagine he had to do for other roles, considering some of the character names listed on his IMDb page with names such as Mr. Chin's shop owner, Wong, Asian guy, Mr. Yu, Mr. Tu's dad, Mr. Yen, Mr. Ho, Mr. Yip. It's a Mr. Ri. Why so many screenplays have an older Asian American man, either friendly and wise or grouchy and comedic, working in service of the main characters who all for some reason won't call him by his first name. Anyway, Cody like pulls a cool driving stunt where the car is like on two wheels and thinking that would impress Natalie. She's definitely intrigued. She's like, I love the way I almost fell out of a car window and died. But the rest of the kids are like, you're crazy. You could have killed her. Anyway, the CIA realizing Cody is not like the ladies man that he said he was. Oh God, I hate this movie. I'm yawning. They bring in all of the special army people to teach him how to be competent, like boxing with Ronica in full fucking makeup. Oh, he gets more time to focus on the mission because the CIA starts doing his homework and his chores, which of course impresses the family. And while they're doing this, for example, Cody uses his hacking skills to figure out some intel on the bad guy, Dr. Brinkman, and his lackey, Mole, who has like a, he was from The Mummy. He has this weird haircut in this. And you know, there are some close calls. They almost get caught, but the whole team clears out just in time for the family to come home and be impressed with all that he's doing. And the mom is like, here's $5. And he's like, thanks. And adds it to his wad of cash. Discussing how Cody actually was exaggerating about his way with the ladies. They get like scientists and anatomy people and a celebrity basketball player to teach him hilarious advice on how to be hit with the ladies. It's really cliche and stupid. I hate this whole movie. I hate this whole movie. I hate this whole movie. They even show him a sexy hologram lady who is like, come into my bedroom and I'll you child. Not literally saying that, but that's the vibe. And it's like too much for me. Like this kid is 15. They are bringing in sexual themes way too young, if you ask me. Anyway, Cody rescues Natalie because she's on a ladder to the top of the building without a spot. Who asked a sophomore girl to climb up to the top of this stone castle and hang a banner. Not her job. So while he's mending her foot with ice, she starts to really fall for like how special he is because he talked nicely about her. I don't know. Oh, I forgot to mention it. His first leg of the mission is basically to get invited to Natalie's birthday party because that'll be his way of being able to explore the house and get more information. And after all of this conversation, he succeeds. She invites him to the party. Ronica comes in fronting as a school nurse, but she doesn't even need to be there to help because Cody Banks is already on the job. So next they sexualize Ronica while she gets out of the car, dropping Cody off at the party. They have CIA agents hiding all around. F Frankie goes to the party. Everyone's watching him. They are playing poker at a kid's party. Whatever. Cody gives a necklace to, what's her name? Nothing more than my heart because that's Happy birthday! This necklace is designed to detonate if you act too slutty or not slutty enough. I still don't really get how this is going to help us find out what Natalie's dad is working on. She doesn't even know. She's like, he's always away working on experiments. Men will just find any reason to stick a GPS tracker on a woman and act like it's a big favor. Congratulations, Natalie. You just lost agency over your own body. Oh, you deserve privacy and transparency? Sorry, you gave that up when your dad decided to be a scientist. Now the CIA is gonna have satellites following you to the mall, ready to shoot your body full of birth control beams just as soon as you try on a V-neck sweatshirt or sample a perfume that has branding that feels too sensual. Because that's the only way we can stop the nanobots. I don't like how this movie makes it seem like it's imperative Natalie never knows about the plan that's surrounding her father or her life and why they have to control her so much. Let women do what they want. It doesn't have to be a 
mission to control them. This is, I just don't like this, the subtext. Anyway, at this party, Cody is being James Bond at the craps table, but the bad guy who he recognizes from his intel is working the poker table. So he outs him to the rest of the band of geeks and they um, start storming the house. I was not really actively watching this part. Liquid nitrogen, why? Oh, so Cody starts climbing through the secret compartments of their house. Oh, and that's where I guess all of this stuff is. Like the secret lab we just saw where the dad is working. It's connected to the underground secret fortress of the house. So Cody is able to see that they are making nanobots and putting them in something. Oh, the nanobots are able to eat metal, which you know, if your nanobot can eat metal, that means you can basically eat the whole army's ass. The dad scientist is like, I didn't want to create this. I wanted to be a good guy. And they were like, well, you're not, you're a bad guy. And I'm, uh, I'm East Asian. It's like, no, you're not either. But you know, here we are. I take it back about the inventions, I guess. Sorry. Can't, can't stop yawning. This movie sucks. He's using his sticky shoes. He's using his magnifying glass. I don't know. So Cody throws his stuff into the car and he's just about to leave when the bullies start picking a fight with him, which unleashes his Kung Fu master. And he starts kicking everybody in the stomachs and faces, punching these random kids and flipping them over. You'll see a lot of adult stunt people in um, the wide shots here. But anyway, Cody basically kicks everyone's ass at this party and Natalie loves it. She's like, I love how you broke my cousin's wrist. You can tell she's really falling for him because girls love witnessing physical violence between men. It makes their sweat. That's just science. I didn't, that's a scientific term. But back at the base, Cody's being taken off the case because they can already tell he's too emotionally connected to his subject. And he's like, what? And they're like, now you have to go back to being a regular degular. And he's like, but I want to be secret magent magent. I didn't pick this career. It picked me. I subscribed to a few spy magazines and surfed the net for some cool sites. The next thing I know, I'm going to a CIA summer camp. Hey, that sounds cool. They probably should have put that in the movie we're watching. Actually, no, maybe I I like that Frankie Muniz just explains the backstory using his words as a device in the third act to close some plot holes. It feels cheap and insufficient, which perfectly matches my healthcare plan. I mean, the primary care physician assigned to me is just smarter child on AOL Instant Messenger. And if I can survive that, I can also handle a little bit of verbal exposition. So stay tuned and we'll see if I survive that. I'm just sending the doctor my symptoms right now. All I'm getting back is a Wikipedia page on black holes. Huh, oh, Dr. Smarter Child must be confused. Not black holes as in space, black holes as in my rotting pussy. I just wanna know if it's a flesh-eating virus or a witch's curse, which is what I suspect because A, I'm starting to look a lot like La Llorona down there, and B, I've been stealing a lot of amulets from elderly hermits in the past few weeks. They snatch Agent Cody's badge off of him and he goes, away. Now, the dad scientist is like no longer working with them. He's refusing to help anymore. So they decide they have to kidnap Natalie to motivate the dad. Natalie shows up at his house, Cody, and they go to a diner and she's like, oh, this is me with my tousling my hair. Oh. Major it girl vibes, we stand eating ice cream that is always melty or solid, melty or solid. Oh, and that's when the poker guy, table guy, henchman comes up and starts chasing them through the diner. They want to kidnap that Natalie girl's ass. Stunt person, stunt person, in the kitchen, choreography, fight choreography, uh, grown men grabbing kids. Take care of him. You know, I gotta say, I don't love all of the physical violence on display in this movie. And I'm not just referring to the way Cody and his bullies resolve conflict by kicking and punching. That's just boys being boys. And I would never interfere with that. You see, boys have to get all of that self-righteous aggression out of their system as children so that they can grow up to be the thriving abusers and murderers that make up our police force. I'm more concerned that this movie is trying to tell kids that they could disarm an attacker by simply tapping them on the sides of the head like a snooze button and then skateboard off to safety. I just don't know if that would be effective if you were actually fighting off an adult who legitimately plans to shoot or strangle you, but I'm not sure. So we'll do an experiment. I need someone in the audience to come up and strangle me, preferably like a pro athlete with hands big enough to palm a basketball. And you should know a lot of different swear words and bonus points if you like to cuddle a little bit afterwards. Okay, fine. But just so you know, that's like a totally normal thing to request at certain gay bars in Germany. It's called culture. On the violence, this movie was already rated 
rated 12A by the British Board of Film Classifications, which is like their MPAA. So kids over 12 could watch it without a parent and no more because like the use of martial arts techniques are shown. In order to keep that rating though, the distributor had to cut a full seven seconds from the film, specifically that double ear clap, because I guess that's where the, they draw the line. A 15 and up cut was released with the seven seconds added back in, which is clearly what we're seeing here. Film ratings are so arbitrary. Anyway, despite all the shenanigans, they really do manage to abduct Natalie and um, they kill her right on the spot. I'm just kidding. Cody wakes up and they're like, all right, you do nothing. You go back home. We're gonna get her back. It's fine, but you're just a kid again. And so Cody goes back and they blames all of these injuries on the bully and they're taking him out of that fancy school now because of the bullies. And when he's back in his room, he accidentally activates the the hologram thing where the invention guy is like, I'm still here to help you. So he has the longitude and latitude of where they took Natalie. The little brother is about to tell on him because he sees us all, but he gets bribed with $5,000 in cash. This kid sucks. Agent Cody goes back to the CIA headquarters where that inept guard lets him right in. The parents back home think he's sleeping. You know, he hacks the phones to distract them and puts the brothers in the bed to fool him. I don't know. It all. We've seen every single second of this. It's also formulaic. If you didn't see it replicated from a James Bond movie, you saw it in the last teen or young adult film that you saw. It was so seen. But C Cody proves that he's able to get around without the CIA's help. He bribed some local townsperson for a fishing boat type of plane, a seaplane. The CIA realizes that Cody's broken in and stolen some of his equipment back, and so they have to follow him to this place where they're keeping Natalie. He's like on a rocket power snowboard, and he goes to the Cascade Mountains, which I assume are a real place near Seattle. I don't know. It doesn't take long before Cody is pursued and he crashes into a tree. He's hanging upside down. And that's when Ronica lands with her flying machine. It's like a personal helicopter thing. And he's like, what are you here to ground me again, sexy mom? And she's like, no, I'm here to help you partner. So we have that character development. And she's like, let's fly off to this next place and do the other thing. Ugh. Why are all of the boys in this movie made to seem like they're seeking out sexual contact in the most unusual ways possible? And yes, that's coming from the person who just brought up the big-handed sex stranglers of Deutschland. Agent Grody Dank here. He just tried to get away with what? Motorboating a grown woman while she operates a personal flying machine? What kind of poetry by Shel Silverstein inspired wet dream does this kid think he's living in? No, Cody, you can turn around so the grown woman can press her pelvis into your lower back. Now that's more comfortable for everyone in the audience, though I still don't feel great. They get to the place <laughs> and Cody does the thing. They climb through the tunnel and they see the main way that they, the bad guys plan to distribute these nanobots to the world. It's like, are you trying to eat through bank vaults or are you trying to literally in dissolve humanity? So that's how they're doing it. The ice cubes. That's how they plan to distribute the nanobots. Everyone uses ice cubes. No one would hit them. Now this is where the movie really loses me. The bad guys are going to destroy society by hiding nanobots in the world supply of ice cubes. This is exactly why I don't support the mega wealthy global ice cube corporations, especially not the main one, clear plastic bag that says ice on it incorporated. That's why I make my ice cubes from scratch using a special recipe I invented. First, you take an ordinary ice tray and fill that with regular tap water, freeze it, and then use that substance substance to fill a bathtub and submerge your body and lower your core temperature down until your heart rate is barely detectable. For that is the only way it is safe to enter the ice dimension without the cold ones detecting your warm blooded life force and seeking you out before you have time to harvest their precious cubes. I know it sounds super complicated, but I'm a foodie. Cody breaks into the place where Natalie is being held and instead of being terrified like a kidnapped victim, she's like, Ugh. I hate it here, let me out. You gave me fashionable black clothing for some reason. They wanted you to match Cody for the poster shots, that's why. So Cody rescues her because he's smart, convinces her to like move, move, move. The bad guys grab Ronica, oh no. Cody uses his inventions to fight people off. Oh yes, Ugh. The bad guy starts monologuing to Ronica and that's a mistake. CIA, right? I love that suit. No place for a gun in there, right? Eh? That's where you're wrong, Dr. Dark Paint. For I can hide a gun up my a or in my rotting a which I did, but unfortunately both were dissolved within minutes of coming into contact with my mucous membranes. 
Hiya! The dad is like, oh, give them the code to program the robots. And he's like, no. So they grab Hillary Duff by her young little neck and start torturing her. I mean, they put ice to her face. They like hold an ice cube of nanobots to her face. And he's like, once the ice melts, these will enter her brain and we don't know what will happen. It's a little uncomfortable throughout. I would say the blocking on these close-ups could have been less of this. Look at the water on your daughter's forehead, doctor. Ice is melting. I guess I'm not particularly loving the way the movie depicts a menacing older man ice torturing Hilary Duff's wet, sad face. But I do love the stylized ice cubes with the glimmering rainbow sparkles. Fabulous. Sir, you must tell me from what quadrant of the ice dimension did you harvest such beautiful cubes? And since your return, don't you hear the cold ones howling constantly inside of your mind? How do you sleep at night? Because I cannot, and I feel myself grow colder every day. Cody does this or that, the kids all fight, they get the girl back, things explode, people are running but not dying of explosions, so that's good. Cody kicks some people. Oh, oh, Hilary Duff's character Natalie just walks right up to Brinkman and shoves that nanobot ice cube right in his mouth and they all sit back and watch this horror. <laughs> The double ear clap had to go, but the British Board of Film Classification was like, now this is a perfectly appropriate image for children. It's not going to be shocking or disturbing to any 12 year olds who have seen a decomposing body in the woods. Can we take a minute to appreciate the A-list cameo they slipped in here? Round of applause for present day Kevin Sorbo, everyone. I noticed that Hilary Duff does not return to be in the sequel of this movie, Agent Cody Banks, London Bridge by Fergie or something. And I would venture to guess that's because she's seeking mental health treatment for the trauma of witnessing a death that she just caused. And she did it knowingly, on purpose. No one asked you to kill that man, Natalie. The CIA wanted to arrest him. There's a judiciary process, but you just walked up and killed him. <gasps> the cold ones must have gotten to her. That's why I'm so done with the ice dimension and it's gay cubes of ice. I now recommend this alternative ice recipe that's been in my family for generations and it should be much safer. We start with the same ordinary ice cube tray and four to five quarts of, and stay with me here, human piss. You know what? It's a family recipe. I should keep it that way. Some things just need to stay within the family. It's a family piss recipe. Gotta keep it secret from your teachers at school. Piss, piss. <laughs> That's just a song we would sing at family gatherings and stuff. I... <laughs> There is now a timer involved for no reason that's going to cause things to explode. So the gang's gotta get out of there, including stunt doubles, blonde girl, and brown hair. Everyone gets into a stupid thing, a helicopter will fly away, except Cody has to stay back to disarm the bomb. And you know, he sees that the girl and the guys are in like a safe distance, but he's got a couple more mini battles to fight. legitimate jump scare. I said, oh, although I don't love the sound design because it's not motivated by anything on set, like a sudden explosion or a pipe bursting to accentuate the guy popping up. In fact, you can distinctly hear a woman's scream, which I know is like the state song of those boys will be boys type of men. They use it to get hyped up when they want to make themselves horny and break things. He fights off this guy by, I think he dies. Like everyone's they kill the bad guys in this, which is like not common in a lot of kids' movies. It's more like, oh, you got me. Not like <laughs> being eaten by the scarab beetles. Anyway, they escape, everything's safe, and he flies off in that shot from the trailer on a helicopter. Oh no, they put the guy in a cage. He's like the bad guy, the secondary bad guy they detain. So he probably would have been a bad guy in the sequel, but maybe not. They just wanted to keep it open. I don't know. Either way, the head of the CIA is like, welcome back to the program, bucko. And um, now Cody gets to enjoy the woman that he's won as a prize, because they're objects to him. Cody, do not turn me off. <laughs> Cody, turn me around the sits. Now, what was my mission? I think you were about to kiss me. I think it was actually about preventing a nuclear attack from North Korea, but I guess YouTube don't want to hear what sexy mama has to say in her holographic voice. You know, I'm starting to see why it isn't that smart to recruit teenagers to be agents in the CIA who are on life or death missions. They have a sense of apathy that will make James Bond look like a pick me high schooler who asks the boys if she can wear their sweatshirt for the rest of class because she's cold. But that's okay because the world is saved for another day thanks to Agent Cody Banks. What did you think of this movie? I 
hated it. Very formulaic, and the parts that weren't formulaic were disappointingly, cringily, not politically correct, which I know some people hate when people care about political correctness, but like, that's distracting from the movie. And if you were a kid who was in special ed, or for a Middle Eastern, or vaguely from non-America in any way, you're gonna feel different when you see that. And those kids are not different, they're perfectly normal, and it's weird for movie and children's media to make them feel different. Like, the white male perspective of the whole movie really soured me on the experience. Let me know what your thoughts were in the comments below. Also, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more Cody Banks. We can dive into the sequel. And also, let me know what other movies we should check out here on Clip Breakdown. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way, you never miss new videos from me that I upload twice a week. Click the notification bell icon and you'll always be the first to know when my hologramic watch is sending me a mission from the headquarters. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon where you can access exclusive episodes, bonus watch parties, and other such things. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for getting devoured from the inside with nanobots with me today. I will see you next time.